Okay, here we have a, a pretty small book. It's not uh, very decorated. It does have some slight gilding at the, uh, the very top of the pages there, but otherwise it's pretty unassuming. It's just got this sort of brownish color and then some slight gold lettering on the side for the title, which is, Is Immortality Desirable? And it's by Goldsworthy Lowe's Dickinson. You can see there's a little bit of a, some wear on the back there. Um, so let's uh, open this up. There's a, some a note there from a previous owner. Um, and here's the an, uh, introductory title page, Is Immortality Desirable? And you can see this is part of a series of lectures on immortality. You've got some here, Human Immortality, Dionysus and Immortality, The Conception of Immortality, Science and Immortality. Uh, it's got one for Buddhism and Immortality, and then the lecture that we're going to check out here, which is, Is Immortality Desirable? And here's the actual title page. Um, so we can see the Ingers Ingersoll Lecture 1908, Is Immortality Desirable? by G. Lowe's Dickinson. And we can see that he's the author of uh, Letters of a Chinese Official, The Greek View of Life, The Meaning of Good, A Modern Symposium, Justice and Liberty. And then here's a nice little... Uh, print uh, from the Riverside Press, which is uh, the publishing house in Cambridge, and this was published in 1909. And then here we have an introductory page here. It says, um, the Ingersoll Lectureship, extract from the will of Miss Caroline Haskell Ingersoll, who died in Keene County of Cheshire, New Hampshire, January 26, 1893. First, in carrying out the wishes of my late beloved father, George Goldthwaite Ingersoll, as declared by him in his last will and testament, I give and bequeath to Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where my late father was graduated, uh, and which he always held in love and honor, the sum of $5,000, as a fund for the establishment of a lectureship on a plan somewhat similar to that of the Dudleyan Lecture, that is, one lecture to be delivered each year on any convenient day between the last day of May and the first day of December, on this subject, the immortality of man, said lecture not to form a part of the usual college course, nor to be delivered by any professor or tutor as part of his usual routine of instruction, though any such professor or tutor may be appointed to such service. The choice of said lecturer is not to be limited to any one religious denomination, nor to any one profession, but may be that of either clergyman or layman, the appointment to take place at least six months before the delivery of said lecture, the above sum to be safely invested and three-fourths of the annual interest thereof to be paid to the lecturer for his services, and the remaining fourth to be expended in the publishment and gratuitous distrib distribution of the lecture, a copy of which is always to be furnished by the lecturer for such purpose, the same lecture to be named and known as the Ingersoll Lecture of the Immortality on the Immortality of Man. So that just explains uh, how this uh, book and lecture came to be. Um, so here we go. This is sort of the, the beginning here. It says, Is Immortality Desirable? Uh, it is with a certain sense of temerity that I stand before you tonight, a sense inspired not only by the place and the audience, but by the subject on which I am to speak. I am succeeding in a famous university many distinguished men, and for that my only apology is the invitation with which I was honored. But also, I am to speak on the immortality of man, and in defense of that audacity what can I say? Surely it may be thought, a man must be very bold or very shameless who is prepared to discourse on such a theme. For either, it would seem, he must profess to know what the wisest have admitted to be beyond their ken, or he must be a charlatan, ready to talk about matters of which he knows nothing. These are hard alternatives, but they do not, I hope, exhaust the possibilities. If I venture to address you on this great subject, it is precisely because I do not suppose that you regard me as a preacher or a prophet. I am here, as I conceive, to make one speech in a debate which proceeds from century to century, which has never uh, been perpetually adjourned and never concluded. For the immortality of man is one of those great open questions which, to my mind, are of all uh, the most worth discussing, even though they may never be resolved. And we're just going to sort of skip ahead here. And it looks like he's got um, 
some quotes here from uh, some poets. So it says, does it seem to you incredible that the body should be the habitation, not the creator of the soul, that this should continue to live when that has died? I can only reply in the words of your own poet. Is it wonderful that I should be immortal as everyone is immortal? I know it is wonderful, but my eyesight is equally wonderful, and how I was conceived in my mother's womb is equally wonderful, and passed from a babe in the creeping trance of a couple of summers and winters to articulate and walk, all this is equally wonderful. And that my soul embraces you this hour, and we affect each other without ever seeing each other and never perhaps to see each other, is every bit as wonderful. And that I can think such thoughts as these is just as wonderful. And that I can remind you, and you can think them and know them to be true, is just as wonderful. And that the moon spins round the earth and on with the earth is equally wonderful. And that they balance themselves with the sun and stars is equally wonderful. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, I do not, of course, suggest that from the intuition of poets anything can be finally concluded about the immortality of man. Uh, but I urge that when we approach the subject, it should be with our imagination alert. Um, so this whole, uh, whole lecture is pretty interesting to anybody who likes this sort of topic and it's not, it's not strictly religious or anything like that. It just explores a lot of different ideas. Um, so it says, let us turn then to our third class, those who desire immortality and ask them what it is they desire and whether it is really desirable for a number of very different conceptions may be covered by the same phrase. And first, there are those who simply do not want to die and whose desire for immortality is merely the expression of this feeling. Um, old people, so far as I have observed, often cling in this way to life, more often indeed than the young. Yet if they could put it fairly to themselves, they would, I suppose, hardly say that they would wish to go on forever in this life, with all their infirmities increasing upon them. Nothing surely is sadder, nothing meaner, than this. Uh, than this desire to prolong life here at all costs. So there it's just sort of bringing into question... Um, whether or not people who claim that they would want to continue living would actually really want to continue living so long. Um, here's a, a bit. It says, this Nietzsche himself quite candidly recognizes. Alas, he says in another place, alas, man recurreth eternally, the small man recurreth eternally. Once I had seen them uh, both naked, the greatest man and the smallest man, all too alike unto each other, all too human, even the greatest man. All too small, the greatest one. That was uh, my satiety of man, an eternal recurrence even of the smallest one. That was my satiety of all existence. Alas, loathing, loathing, loathing. And uh, uh, here you can see there's some pencil marks from a previous owner marking uh, sections that were perhaps meaningful to them at some point. That's one of the uh, joys of... Uh, reading old books like this that are acquired through sort of secondhand means um, is you'll often find uh, things that tell a little bit of a story of the uh, previous owner in them, um, if not direct notes, just other sort of annotations and um, markings that kind of indicate how it was used. Oh, and here we have a whole section that's underlined. Um, it says, to sum up then the immortality which I hold to be desirable and which I suggest to you as desirable is one in which a continuity of experience analogous to that which we are aware of here is carried on into a life after death, the essence of that life being the continuous unfolding, no doubt through stress and conflict, of those potentialities of good of which we are aware here as the most significant part of ourselves. Um, I hold that the desirability of this is a matter of plain fact and that in putting it forward I am giving no evidence of superstition, weakness, or egotism, but on the contrary, am recognizing the deepest element in human nature. Some of you probably will agree with this, others will strongly disagree, and to those who disagree, I have no further arguments to address. We disagree invincibly and finally. Um, so, looks like that, that section was important to the previous owner here. And then it looks like we're at the end, so uh, it's a pretty short lecture. It says, um, Let's see what the, it says here. Uh, and in asking you tonight, as clearly as I can, the question, do you want immortality and in what form? I conceive myself to be doing something very practical. I'm not merely asking you 
though that in itself is important, to become clear with yourselves on a point of values. I am asking you further to take seriously a branch of scientific inquiry which may have results more important than any other that is being pursued in our time. And that's how that lecture ends, and there's a, a series of uh, notes at the end here for uh, just uh, supplementary information, it looks like. And just a final uh, message from the publisher there. All right, so that's the book is Immortality Desirable by G. Lowe's Dickinson. Um, if you like that, uh, feel free to leave us a comment or subscribe, and thanks for watching. Bye.